All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're gonna give it just a few minutes for folks to get logged on. Okay. Yeah, it's a bunch of people coming in, it's great. Yeah. Uh, our third question for the day, if you wanna throw it in the chat, I'm gonna let Bill ask it. You wanted to ask about yeah. what, uh, NFL rivalries? <laughs> well, not about right, but just what what team are you for, right? We've got a, a Dallas Cowboy on here, you know, uh, uh, DC local native uh, Redskins, Washington football team, Commanders fan here. Not much of a rivalry the last, I don't know, fifteen years or so, but you know, back in the day, back in the nineties, it was a little more even. Well, come on, Dave. That's well, of course, Dave. That we just. <laughs> are we just doing NFL? Because I'm not an NFL fan, but go Gators. If anyone, yeah, you know, you can throw yeah, college you know. in there. <laughs> See too many. Yeah, sorry, Cleveland Browns. I like that. I guess the bit. <laughs> it's not real comfortable. Longhorns. Basketball. Yep. Real but... football. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Getting to uh, almost to March Madness. <clears throat> nice, she says. Okay, uh, more than our share of uh, Packers fans here. Interesting. Broncos checking in. All right. Wow, Wendy, I'm sorry. That's uh, uh, that may be the the one fan base that is uh, even more uh, critical than uh, DCs. All right. Uh, Thank All right, you. cool. Yeah, we got a bunch. Let's uh, uh, let's get going. All right. Thanks again for joining us. I'm Katrina McPhee. I'm the Director of Growth Marketing at Association Analytics. This is our Analytics in Action series. Um, today, you're joining Using Your Data to Improve Member Engagement. Um, and your hosts today are Bill Conforti. He's our SVP of Strategy and Solutions. So that means he works closely with our product and our sales teams to um, sell the best product in the association industry, Acumen AI. And then we have a very special guest. We're super excited to have her here, Lisa Buchanan. She's the VP of Engagement and Digital Strategy for IAEE or IAEE. Apparently you can say it however you'd like. Um, she'll tell us a little bit about herself and IAEE in a few minutes. Um, for now, I'll hand it over to you, Bill. All right. Thanks a lot. Let's uh, let's get it going. So on the agenda today, um, as usual, start off with a little bit of intro information and a couple of polls. So uh, get your phones out and ready for that. Uh, we're going to learn about IAEE. Um, I'm going to give you three strategies to improve engagement. So um, I've been trying to closely follow the rule of three um, for the last well, pretty much forever, but uh, definitely for the last few webinars. So we'll break it down into three buckets. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the data side of it, the engagement uh, analytics. And we'll have pro tips that will mostly be leases, but I might uh, check in with a few myself. And then we'll have Q&A at the end. But as always, um, encourage you to ask questions, make comments, and kind of participate um, all the way through. That makes it a lot more fun, and uh, we will uh, learn more in the process. So a lot of you know... This is part of a uh, six-part series. So this is number two. In January, we covered new member acquisition, and uh, that one is available on our site. So you can get that on demand if you missed it. Um, you can also sign up for the series um, using the link, which will magically appear in the chat uh, here in a minute. And uh, the next one we're going to be talking about is optimizing uh, your event revenue. Right. So I bet Lisa knows uh, uh, a bit about that. Uh, as well. All right. Um, so quick introduction for association analytics, in case you don't know us, uh, we work only with associations. We only do analytics. Um, so we have tons of experience in that area, uh, 20 plus years. Um, we have a product called Acumen AI, which we've developed. It's a SaaS based tool and um, clients uh, love it and a very high retention rate um, and all of that. So I encourage you to uh, to check us out if you want to learn more, and we'll have a link at the end if you want to do that. Um, okay, so it's uh, poll time. Let's get our phones out, and we'll go to our first poll question. So what percentage of your members have very little or no engagement with your association? All right, so it's kind of like reverse here. So if you say 0 to 25, uh, that means that 
most of your members are highly engaged, right? So the very small percentage have zero or very little engagement. Okay, a lot of us don't know. A lot of us are saying 26 to 50. We have a lot of people on here and the participation rate is unsatisfactory so far, I will say that. So get those phones out and let's, uh, uh, let's get, I'll give you a, a few more seconds and then we'll, then we'll talk about the results, but uh, we got one more poll and then uh, a few other things to, um, Ah, how do you vote? So, Sarah, I apologize. Um, there is a QR code on the upper left of your slide. And if you point your phone at that QR code, that'll take you to a site um, called Slido. And there are two tabs on the page. There's one called Q&A and one called Polls. So you'll want to be on the tab called Polls. And once you get there, um, the question will appear as if by magic. All right. Um, so while people are continuing uh, to vote, um, Lisa, I want to ask you, is anything here surprising? Well, de depending on, um, you know, what type of association it is. Uh, no, I, I, I don't necessarily think so. Okay. Uh, well, I, on the other hand, am a little surprised. So... Uh, thirty-seven percent uh, don't know. I think that is, um, I think that is, is quite in line with what we see in terms of you know we're going to talk about engagement scoring and uh, the analytics you know behind all of that. And for the most part, um, associations are doing that sort of in a rudimentary way if they're doing it at all. So um, I think a lot of times don't know. I think that's, um, I think that's pretty valid. Now, the rest of it is kind of inverted for me meaning that mm. I would say the ones in the 26 to 50 um, should be smaller and the 76 to 100 um, should be a little bit bigger because because I probably worded the question in an awkward way, to be honest. Um, you know, the what we see in in most associations is that most, and when I say most, it's in, in a good one, it's, you know, 50%, a little over 50. In one that's not really doing much on engagement, it can be, 80% or more that aren't really uh, engaged according to the um, to the models that they set out. So anyway, I'm a little bit uh, surprised to see that. And um, so think about this question. We're not going to ask it again officially, but by the time we go through and, and talk about how IAEE is doing things to measure engagement, um, uh, I would be curious if anyone would uh, would change your answer on that. Uh, so Barbara agrees with me. So that's, uh, that's good to hear. Thank you for that. All right. Um, so let's get to the next one. What is the most important way you provide value to your members or your customers? Education. 100% was only one response, though. That's right, so why if you can't see the last one, it says industry practice info and resources. So we're talking about like best practices, industry reports, publications, things like that. Okay. Yeah, that's that happens a lot of this, right? So a lot of times, like education and events are um, are one and the same. So um, I would say it's education in that case, right? Uh, but I understand that there's a there's a big overlap here. So yeah, once again, all right, my uh, uh, the wording of my of my poll questions maybe is not quite as clear as it could be. Uh, okay, all right. So uh, education, we got about forty percent, twenty percent for networking, right? Advocacy, fifteen, sixteen percent. Um, practice info and resources, standards and certs and events. Okay, so, um, you know, that's probably a little bit due to the wording. I might expect events to be uh, a little bit higher, but, you know, agreed that it's, you know, separating 
the event, right, from the networking aspect of it and the education aspect of it, right, there's a big overlap between those two. So uh, between those three things. So um, any uh, any comments or, or surprises on that, Lisa? Uh, a little surprised that networking wasn't um, a little higher, but um, all in all, I think it falls in very similarly with, with us. So, so uh, Laura's making a very good point here. She said that there's a difference between what the members think is most important and what's kind of most valued by the association. Um, if anyone has um, seen our webinars on engagement and engagement scoring before, um, we we talk about how engagement is an exchange of value, right, between the member or between the customer and the association. And the trick is to find that sweet spot where the member or the customer, you know, feels that they're getting value and the association is also getting value from that relationship. And yes, I totally agree, right? So there are definitely certain types of activities that, um, that are more weighted towards, you know, the association getting value and vice versa. And also the, um, the way that different segments and different individuals um, experience the value that your association provide is also quite different, which is an excellent segue into the next slide, uh, which is about uh, IAEE. So, uh, so Lisa, tell us, uh, tell us about your association. Sure. So IAEE, the International Association for Exhibition and Events, is the leading global association for those that plan, produce, and service the exhibition and events industry. Um, our members are organizers or planners of trade shows and live events and um, also those that provide products and services to the organizer members. Um, we are a trade association with a um, little over 1,100 member organizations and nearly 11,000 member individuals, or I like to refer to them as member representatives um, within those companies. Um, we are uh, a small but mighty team of 20. Uh, we're located here in Dallas, Texas. Um, we uh, also uh, are all remote. Uh, most of us, uh, I would say 75% of us are here in the Dallas Metroplex um, and 15% are um, outside of Texas. So that's just a little bit about us. All right. Uh, awesome. So, so uh, Lisa, tell us then about your um, your your sources, right? Your key data and your key sources, uh, demographics, and things like that. Sure. So we um, we collect um, on the the organizational level and on the individual level. So a couple of key uh, items that we collect on the um, organization level is um, industry industry sector. So um, that has to do with um, what uh, type of trade show your company supports, whether it could, it could be healthcare, it could be government, education, transportation. So that's a way that we segment our members. Um, we also collect uh, what type of organization they are. They may be an association, they may be a corporate member, they may be independent or even a consumer uh, event show. We have both business to business and consumer event um, members with us. Okay. We, we also collect um, largest net square footage. So um, my answer regarding networking, we're all about trade shows. And so yeah. that's not just about um, what well, is education, but in a different format. Um, it's about business to business relationships. And so we collect um, net square footage. Uh, we also collect total attendance at events, uh, the budget and uh, show name for the company organizer. Then we have a separate lane for suppliers. And so we collect what type of service or product that they may um, offer which we have over 75 different categories. And we also collect the regions in which um, they provide the service. So some may be global, some may only be on the East Coast of the United States. So we collect that information too for our organizer member. Then awesome. 
on the individual side, um, we collect uh, position type. So that may be manager, uh, coordinator, vice president, department. Um, that could be the uh, marketing or sales department, um, events and uh, operations. We collect year born, years in the industry, uh, gender types of events, um, and where those events are planned. So uh, we we have a lot of data. Awesome. Yeah, that was uh, yeah that that was a lot there. As you as you were ticking uh, through all of those things, I was I was thinking about our you know our, our our talks about data quality and data completeness and all of that. And I was I was um, imagining like a whole separate conversation we could have about you know how complete all of those different fields are uh, and that sort of thing. But we'll do that uh, another day. Um, but I do want to ask you the um, to, I've been talking about value proposition. It seems like uh, a lot recently, and um, one of the things, one of the slides, one of the statistics that's been in a couple of our recent presentations is the amount. Uh, or the prevalence of clear and compelling value propositions among associations. And uh, yeah, one of the things that surprises me is this was this was a, a survey, but 46% of association uh, leaders in this survey said that they didn't really have uh, a clear value proposition, right? And, and then another, and 22% said that not only did they not have one, but they weren't developing it or weren't even working on it, which was pretty shocking. But in any case, um, would you say that IAE has a clear value proposition? And if so, how would you describe it? Yeah, so I, I would say yes, we do. Um, I will say that it that um, it has evolved um, and it will probably continue to evolve as our members needs uh, change. Um, but it is clear and um, I feel like it shares how and why someone would need to uh, be a part of our community, um, our association, um, with specific ways that we connect the buyer and seller uh, within the industry. All right. And then so today we're here to talk about engagement. So just just very briefly, because we're going to um, you know go into this as uh, as we get to the rest of today's talk. But what does what does engagement mean, right, at the individual and the org level? Kind of, what are like some of the most important things that you care to track for engagement purposes? Um, I would, I'd love to say that I like to track everything, um, but there we, you know, we we have to be um, focused on what what we are tracking. But I like to track um, the number of events that people attend. Um, what types of topics that they're interested in, um, how they're engaging with us, whether it's downloading a report or logging on to our community platform or even opening an email. Um, so the, we, we look at a lot of variations of engagement um, throughout the course of the year. Okay. Uh, awesome. Yeah, thanks. So, so we're going to dive uh, dive more into that and talk about um, how those kinds of things that you care about, those activities that mean a lot to that exchange of value between members and customers in the association, how all of that translates into um, engagement model that you can obviously you can um, yeah, utilize all of your data on. Okay. So as promised, uh, we're going to break this up into three strategies, and um, so we could we. There could be three others, right? There's lots of different ways that you can bucket this, but I thought it was kind of interesting. And um, and Lisa and her team have some really good uh, examples um, of these first two of you know what a couple, what, what's called a blue ocean strategy, right? We're kind of creating new and innovative products and services. You're, you're not necessarily competing with uh, with current competitors. You're kind of finding space that's less competitive or, or maybe not competitive at all. There's underserved populations, things like that. Uh, then you can double down, you can find that product or service or that segment that's really working well and that you're doing great. And you can kind of uh, reinvest in, in those things. And then uh, the last one is kind of like what ties it all together. It's ask and observe, which we've talked about um, before. But really what I mean by that is it's yes, ask and yes, observe, but really all of the um, data collection and the test and learn process uh, that goes along with that, right? Because that informs your decisions. 
It helps you collect, you know, behavioral data and also the psychographic uh, as well. And ultimately that helps you to uh, continuously improve. So uh, those are the, the three broad strategies, right? You could bucket those a little bit differently, but I think this is uh, a good way to think about it for today. So, um, so Blue Ocean first, right? Um, so as we said, we're going to look for uh, unmet needs, um, underserved populations. We're going to focus on unique value, right? We've talked about that in, in other webinars, but the idea is what can your association do? What can you provide that others can't, right? What can you be best at, right? You want to fill that space. Um, you want to innovate, and often that's going to mean creating um, some type of content. It doesn't have to be big, expensive content, right? It could be repurposing some things you already have, but um, doing something that is unique to your association and maybe even unique to a specific uh, segment of your market. Um, and, and in Blue Ocean, you're focused more on differentiating than kind of out-competing in something that's already kind of a commodity. Um, in your space. So all that said, uh, Lisa, what is, um, what would you say as an example of how IEEE was able to, to innovate as a result of your work around uh, member engagement? Sure. So we looked at um, several different um, segments of our uh, titles or roles, if you will, um, and noticed an underserved uh, department um, which was our meeting and event planners uh, area. And so we developed a educational series of six webinars um, that uh, met that need. Um, typically we're focused more on the, the trade show aspect of it, um, but as a trade association, we have this large segment of meeting and event planners um, that also need education. So um, that was one area that we felt we could uh, definitely uh, focus on and yeah. and increase non-dues revenue. Yeah, perfect. Yes, yeah, so a couple of people are in the chat asking um, what, uh, what I was also going to ask, which is how did you identify them as an underserved um, population. So um, we looked at uh, our our dashboard um, and saw that those individuals did not um, engage with us uh, very much. Um, again, many of their colleagues within those companies were, but these particular roles roles were not engaging with us. Um, why? Because we didn't have uh, content. Uh, that they could digest. So um, we uh, we tried to um, create that uh, mm -hmm. with repurposing some of the content that we already had and um, finding committee members that um, would volunteer um, as experts and um, really led the charge in uh, providing that content to our members. And we again, packaged it with a series of six. And um, what we did is we we offered the total package and then we also sold each of the segments separately. Uh, we did launch this in the summer. So it was every other week um, mm -hmm. was some content which spread throughout the course of the entire summer. Awesome. And, was, and this was content was not for any kind of certification or credential. This was just for professional development, correct? This was just for professional development. I mean, Absolutely. just, right? Professional right. development is, is perfectly. I mean, uh, you, you, could, you could use it for your continuing education credit, credits, obviously, um, but no, it did not uh, uh, line up with a certification. All right. Uh, so I'm getting just, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, right? Because you talked about how you were able to observe Right by exploring your data, uh, by manipulating your uh, demographic filters and things, you identified this uh, this underserved population. Um, did you also ask them? Right? Were there any? Uh, was there actually any uh, explicit you know data survey responses or things like that that led you to this as well? We we do we have um, we have an annual member survey that we conduct um, as well as. Um, 
webinar surveys that we can conduct after each um, educational topic that we offer. And at that point, we asked the question: What topics would you like to ah, um, would you would you like to hear more about? And um, as you can tell, we would uh, aggregate the data and come up um, with that. So we had a hypothesis, we tested it, and um, yes, there was a need. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, so then, tell us about the the process for creating that. Right. So some of us. You know, there's a, a range of all sizes of associations. I was very surprised, by the way, um, to hear that you have that you're a team of only of only 20 based on, you know, th this much uh, content creation and things. So for all of you that are listening, that are thinking that a si an association that's a size 20 is too small, that's it's actually, you know, solidly in the medium range, right? If not boarding on large, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, for associations. But anyway, so. Uh, how did you, how were you able to do that to uh, create all of that? Well, um, it it's interesting because we were in the middle of our budget cycle too. So we ne didn't necessarily allocate funds to have those speakers um, come in. So we, it was kind of, uh, we were on a shoestring budget, if you will. And um, we just, we kind of dove into some of the webinars that we had produced uh, a few years back. We had looked at um, some of the uh, white papers that had been produced and just pulled some of that information together and again, repurposed the content and um, led with some of our committee volunteers as our experts. All right, uh, awesome. Uh, okay, so um, Jill has a question in the chat, but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that one sit for just a second because we're gonna get there in a few minutes. But I do want to ask you about um, certifications, right? So uh, so IAWA offers some certifications, and as I remember from our conversation, you're able to find some ways to engage members around this process as well that that I consider kind of you know fitting for a blue ocean type strategy. Sure. So we, um, as an organization, created a journey, if you will, for our industry professionals. We have a workforce uh, ready certificate. So that is zero years um, in the industry. Uh, you can be out of high school, out of college, switching careers, uh, come in and go right into that workforce ready certificate. We also have um, our designation, the Certification in Exhibition Management, which is the CEM, which is three to five years in the industry. And we also have um, our CEMAP, which is our Certification in Exhibition Management, Advanced Professional, um, and that's 10 plus years of experience. So um, you can see that we have multiple uh, certifications, uh, and um, opportunities for our members to be certified. Um, you want me to go ahead and answer the how? Yeah, so, so I mean, the, the part of that that was interesting for, for me, and, and I think that's very fitting with this under, I mean, not necessarily underserved, but it's like a, a new area that, you know, that most associations wouldn't really think about, which is, you know, if I have a certification that, is available to people with three plus years of experience, what can I do in years zero through three to prepare them for that, right? And what kind of content can we create to, um, yeah, to, to satisfy what's essentially an, an, an untapped uh, um, area, right? Yeah, so we look at several different factors. We looked at years in the industry. We looked at um, what type of member they were, student or professional. Um, we looked at even their join date um, to figure out, you know, where they were in their career journey to kind of offer those various segments. Um, we obviously started with our students first with the uh, Workforce Ready Certificate, but as they were developing over the last, we, last year and a half, um, we started serving them up content um, about the CEM program and uh, even offered them opportunities to take the course. Even though they could not certify, mm -hmm. um, they could still sit for the course. And so that's that's just a way to introduce um, our certification program um, to that, that 
that audience and nurture them um, yeah. until they're year three. Yeah, that's uh, that's really smart, right? Because everybody knows like years one and two are the hardest to retain those members. You get them started um, towards something that they can get in year three. And obviously, you know, they're going to stick around in order to do that. So um, so Blue Ocean Strategies about thinking about innovation and net new stuff. But another new way to improve engagement is to double down on stuff that you already know um, that's working. Right. So you find it, you invest in building it out and then you promote it. Right. So um, so Lisa, you found some segments that were highly engaged and you took it, took advantage of that. So uh, tell us about that. So we noticed that we had a large segment segment of individuals uh, who attended webinars. They were um, a CEM, so they held that designation. And so we wanted to um, enhance uh, opportunities for, for those folks. And so we dove into the data and, um, saw that these a lot of these individuals are, were in the sales department. And so um, from there, we developed a sales series um, that we launched actually last summer. And it was a three-part series that we offered one um, each month. So looking at the dashboard, visualizing that information, um, we were able to 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 focus on um, delivering that content and and meet the the need of those those folks. Cool. Um, yeah. So uh, and as as I remember, this was before you'd really started doing engagement scoring, right? So somebody else already commented in the um, in the chat. You know, that's the, the, a lot of the things you're tracking. It's profile and 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 demographic data, right? So it's not. It's not rocket science, really, right? The kinds of ways that you're slicing and dicing the, the data. And then on top of that, you haven't really got to any sophisticated modeling or scoring yet, but still, right, directionally, you're able to tell um, who's, uh, who's it, right? I mean, maybe not the difference between an, you know, an eight and a nine, right? But the difference between a 80 and a 20 or something like that, right? Those are things that you could uh, already tell, yeah? Well, actually, we... We had just stood up the um, engagement module, um, and I had not really been utilizing utilizing it to the fullest extent. So I just buried in the data from our event uh, module is is where I where I um, really saw this. Good. Um, okay. And what about the non engaged members? Right. So. Um, ex, you know, maybe it doesn't apply to people on this call, right? Because they don't have so many non-engaged members. But for those of us who do, uh, what did you do to, uh, you know, get some of those uh, populations involved? So we do have our fair share of um, unengaged, or I like to say less engaged um, there we go. members. There we go. So we uh, looked at uh, similar personas. Um, and served up the the same sort of content. So we looked at those that were highly engaged, um, what they were consuming, and then served up, you know, very similar content to those that were less engaged. And another thing that I'll share is, um, I don't even know wh where I read this, but if you start with a question, and then you answer that question, um, within that content, it, it, engages people more. And so we did that. We combed our um, community web board and came up with three questions that we felt we could answer. And um, we're, we're getting great engagement from that, um, from the less engaged individuals. All right. Uh, okay. Now to Jill's question, which I've been uh, sitting on all this time. Um, so you added all of this stuff. Um, were you able to retire or divest or stop doing anything to make room for all of this new stuff? Uh, and if so, and if so, how did your data inform that decision? Yes. So we have, um, we have stopped, uh, not necessarily a educational event, but we stopped our three of our newsletters. Um, so we are no longer, uh, creating that content. Um, and part of the reason why is we looked at our open rates. So um, we had as low as 16.38%. Uh, I just looked at it earlier today and as high as um, 20%. But 
they they weren't engaging with with the content. Um, that was just the open rate. The click through rates were minimal. Um, and with the work that we had to put into those newsletters, um, we felt that it wasn't a perceived value. Um, so what we're doing is uh, we have a monthly newsletter that um, we rotate a corner. And so uh, from those three newsletters, we'll put a little snippet in that corner um, once a month and we'll rotate that every three months. All right. So being really didn't really um it's hard to get rid of things right we all know that in, oh gosh, in associations yes. right so the uh, the newsletters maybe were um, a high effort thing that people were a little bit happier to uh, to get uh, to get rid of okay awesome all right so that that takes us to um to the next one which is ask and observe right and so this one uh, we've kind of um seen this a lot right so the explicit is the data that we ask for. It's provided to us directly through a survey or something like that. Implicit data is what we have to work for, right? We have to explore data, find those insights. Um, we can infer some things, preferences and interests and things like that. Uh, it helps us to validate, right? Because, you know, what people say and what they do are not always the same thing. And very often they're not. And so we, we use the data that we observe to validate you know, the, uh, the explicit data that the members or customers provide us. And of course, um, you know, to Lisa, all of Lisa's points so far, we have to look at the consumption of the products and services and the satisfaction and all of that. And that gives us um, this sort of feedback loop for uh, continuous improvement. Um, so Lisa, your, uh, your org does a great job of soliciting feedback from members and customers. Uh, what are some of the ways you do that, right? Um, so you mentioned, for example, you mentioned before how much people like your webinars. Um, how do you know that? So we um, we survey our members every opportunity we can find after a webinar, after a peer-to-peer -peer collaboration series, um, after any one of our events. Um, we do poll questions. We have an annual survey. Um, so we do a variety of things to kind of keep a pulse on um, what our members are asking and saying about the products and services that that we're delivering. Okay. Uh, yeah, great segue uh, to, to ask, right? And as you were talking about that, I was, I was thinking, because I, I mean, we hear, I don't, I don't want to say complaints, but many associations report low response and low engagement rates on, on surveys. And um, um, even if they're small micro type surveys, and it occurred to me that your audience might be a little more receptive than usual because they, in their jobs, often rely on survey results, you know, from others. So maybe they're a little bit more attuned and, and, um, uh, might respond at a higher rate than your average association member. I don't, you know, there's absolutely no data behind that. It just occurred to me right now. Uh, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but um, the, I do think this is an area where there are a lot of missed opportunities, right? A lot of people could be doing better with this. And I, I just want to spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, can you tell us about, you know, like how your surveys work, how do you administer them? What kind of response rates do you get? Uh, things like that. Sure. So I would agree with you um, as as a uh, membership engagement individual, I feel compelled to complete every survey that um, I'm served up. So I do agree with you, Bill. Uh, so we use SurveyMonkey as our main source of gathering information. Um, we also have a polling feature on our community platform, as well as HubSpot forms um, is another way that that yeah. we um, collect data. We uh, I will say that I may keep my survey in the field uh, a little uh, longer because I set a a calendar reminder every two to three days to go in and check uh, to see how many people have completed the survey and if I've uh, received a statistic statistically valid um, response rate. We get, um, depending on the survey, anywhere from uh, eight to 20 percent uh, return. Um, even with our member surveys, we get uh, about 12 to 15 percent return rate. So um, pretty good. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, and then the the data that you collect, just tell us, do you know briefly about that? Like, for example, do you uh, do you repeat the same questions, you know, year and you track responses and changes, trends year over year, things like that? We do. So um, for our educational webinars and peer to peer collaborations, we do keep um, the same questions. Typically, we have an NPS score and we ask, you know, what topics you would like to see next um, and maybe one other generic question mm -hmm. for our annual um, member survey. We do tend to keep a baseline of some of the main questions that we ask because we want to measure those trends year over year. But then we throw in three or four um, additional questions that, you know, we're trying to test and um, want to make sure we we're we have the right pulse. So okay. um, it's, it's uh, kind of a variety. Yeah. And so just a just a quick comment, right, because uh, you guys hear me talking about Acumen very often and uh, the custom workspace in Acumen is an amazing place to deal with and aggregate survey data. But can do it without that, right? So, um, so Lisa, all of the things that you talked about, um, you know, saving year over year and that analysis, that's done in, in SurveyMonkey right now, correct? That is, that's done in SurveyMonkey. All right, uh, so no excuses that you're thinking that you need a fancy tool uh, to do this sort of stuff. Okay, uh, so the next thing I wanna talk about, and um, this one is, is a little bit of a detour, but um, it came up in my conversation with Lisa and I wanted to share this with everyone because I think this is kind of low hanging fruit that uh, any association can do. And I want to give Lisa a chance to uh, promote it a little bit. So this is uh, something called uh, Buzz Hours. Tell us about that. So this um, actually started during COVID when we could not have our in-person meetings and our members wanted to connect and um, discuss challenges and opportunities for success and um, you know, to continue the, these conversations and just be able to connect. Well, um, fast forward um, nearly, what, three, four years, and we are still doing them. Um, we have uh, several different options for each of our members. Um, we really have something for everyone where you come into workspace similar to this, but we use just meeting Zoom and, um, we have uh, a topic for the month and um, it's facilitated either by myself or one of the colleagues, um, one of my colleagues. And it, it's, it just takes a, it takes shape of, of itself. Um, uh, after you plant a couple of questions, um, people seem to enjoy the interaction. Um, and again, we survey our members um, after this, uh, event, but I don't think these are going away. Um, they don't necessarily take the place of face-to-face -face either. It just gives people a, a break from maybe the the day. Um, I do mine on Friday, so it's a nice way to to end the week. All right. Um, great. So, so uh, Lillian's asking how many people to get. I think uh, I asked the same question when mm -hmm. this came up. Yeah. We get anywhere from 30 to, to 50 uh, people, uh, on average. So, um, it's a, it's a nice conversation, but it, it's not too big. Um, I think for me, 25 to 30 is, um, the sweet spot where you can still interact and everyone is almost on one screen, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and that the other thing I, I think it was kind of obvious, but just to, to clarify, I mean, this is mostly, right. I mean, the, the, the members decide what they want to talk about, Right. Yep. The uh, IWE staff is there to facilitate, you know, but primarily the content is also generated by the members. And so this is something that almost any association can put together with little or no resources. Right. And it's, it doesn't require a big budget. It doesn't require a lot of time and effort. Um, but I think there's um, a good chance of, of really high uh, value uh, for the members. So highly recommend this. So um, uh, buzz hours. So uh, uh, try it out. All right. um, and, and, and I will say that one other thing is we do um, a takeaway document from this too. So oh, yeah. people have a, a one pager of, of nice tips that they received from the, from the event. Awesome. All right. So that's a great way to, to ask members what they want. And the other thing that we also want to do is we want to observe uh, mm -hmm. by looking at 
behaviors, right? So, Salisa, so and then also I want to ask the audience to kind of participate in this. What are some of the behaviors that we can observe that we can observe to learn more about members and customers? Did you want me to go, or are you? I, want, I wanted you to go, and anybody okay. else would go in the uh, in the chat as well. Um, um, absolutely. So, um, obviously product and publication downloads um, is, is a way that we can we can look at engagement. Oh, there we go. Um, registrations is, is obviously another one. Um, I, I like the email interaction um, is another one that I find fascinating, um, especially for uh, company interaction with our primary contacts and things like that. Um, and and poll questions too. So lots of ways to in, engage with your with your members and observe um, what they're what they're taking part in. Sure. Right. Uh, social media volunteers uh, volunteering maybe uh, donations uh, would be uh, would be another good one. Writing right. Yeah. Content contributions. That's mm -hmm. a great one. It's. Um, find that there, it's a little bit tricky to to reliably collect the, that sort of data, but those are great um, as well. So um, uh, yeah, so let's let's move on. Right, there, there are lots of things you can observe. The key thing is is we want to do both. Right, we want to ask, we want to observe, and we want to use those things to um, kind of validate each other. Uh, so let's let's get into the analytics a little bit more for the last ten minutes or so. We talked about what you do with all that engagement data. Um, but how do you get there, right? So first, we obviously, we have to collect the data. So all the things that we just talked about, the, you know, registrations and the transactions and the volunteering and all of that. Um, but then we have to do something with it. We have to, to measure it and score it. And so I wanted to end this um, because it's about improving your engagement with data. I want to do a quick engagement modeling exercise, right? And so we have lots of um, lots of material on this, so there's full hours on this, but um, just to remind everybody, the engagement score, it represents and reflects your value proposition, right? So it might look something like this as a donut or as a pie, where the sections of the pie or the donut represent the activities, and the size of the section represents kind of how important that is, right? So um, the score should align with your value prop and your members' expectations, right? So uh, building the model is the important thing and you can start simple right so this what you're looking at here is what's called the standard engagement model that you know that comes with acumen and it's very simple right so for individuals it's events community membership sales and marketing right and we you know we there's specific definitions but just broadly speaking that's what it is and for orgs it's even simpler right membership and sales uh, and so um, i thought we would focus on the um, on the uh, individual, you know, for, uh, you know, for today. And I just wanted to ask uh, Lisa, let's, what, you know, uh, you've worked with this a little bit now, right? What have you found to be some of the limitations of the, the quote unquote, the standard model? Um, yeah, so this is definitely on my wish list. I, I will, I will tell you um, that, that that's what's up next for us. Um, I don't think you knew that bill, but uh, it is. Um, yes. We, you know, I want to dive into our community a little more. I'd like to um, weight Sorry. the opportunities um, for those that post, those that, you know, like a post, those that connect with um, another contact. There's so many ways that, you know, you can slice and dice that information. And right now it's just full activities. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to to weight that um, a little bit. I'd also like to um, weight our events, the different events, um, possibly our annual conference and um, booth registrations would be rated a little little different than maybe uh, the educational webinars. Um, so that that are my those are my initial thoughts. Yeah. Right. So. Um... You know, you don't need just one one section or one bucket called events. You can break that out, right? You, you like you said, your um, you might have like your first tier events, right? Your big annual uh, conference, in person events, maybe get um, one section of your model. Maybe webinars, um, 
webinars and buzz hours, right? I would maybe combine those two because they're, uh, even if the content might be a little bit different, like the level of engagement is similar and that's kind of how you think about it. Um, maybe have chapter events or, or other things that you would want to uh, capture for events. Um, and what about, what about learning, right? We've talked a lot about learning. Um, how would you, um, how would, how would you measure my engagement with your, uh, with your learning products? Would it be by credits or by registrations or completions? How would you do that? Well, I think um, it, well, I, I mean, I don't know exactly how this works, but I think it would be through um, the credits that, that you receive because we, you receive a CE credit after each of the various courses and the amount of time that you, you've been on those um, uh webinars and, and buzz hours. And then um, maybe from sort of from a certification standpoint too, who has a certification, who doesn't, and maybe weighted who's in the process, like the candidate that's in the process of mm -hmm. the certification. Okay. Would be my first thought. Yeah. All right, cool. So what um uh, what are uh, what are some of the other ways that uh, that members or uh, or customers engage? Right, you talked about community, right? I mean, that's uh, that's definitely one. Um, what about just other member benefits that are kind of like available? They're part of their their dues already, but you want to maybe see if they're taking advantage of those or not. Uh, um. So, I, you know, our career center posts, so job posts. Um, we would uh, look at our preferred partner program and who's engaging in in that. Um, that information comes over to uh, Acumen. Um, chapter events would be mm -hmm. another uh, area that I think we could could leverage, and then also um, publication downloads. Uh, yeah. We have we have several different publications that we produce um, biannually. So um, measuring those as well. All right. Um, so uh, you can see that I, I put up in the corner there just a, a sample of, so, so what Lisa and I were doing and the reason why, uh, the reason why we had that conversation is that is very similar to what I would highly recommend that you do in your organization to kind of flesh out what are the important activities that you can measure and how do they affect engagement? And how might you weight them towards this model, which has the full picture of that exchange of value with uh, your members and your association? So, um, so it might look something like what we have up here, uh, you like your tier one events, or maybe twenty five percent. Your webinars and buzz hours are another fifteen. We're uh, learning is really important, so we're going to look at credits earned, or maybe we do count of registrations. But either way, it's you know it's maybe twenty percent of our model. Um, certifications are important, but that's kind of a yes, no thing. There's not much of a range there. So we're going to give a small piece to that. Um, community activities are important. Sales is just a way of rather than separating paid and, and unpaid, you know, events or, or registrations across all of the other things, just have one bucket that just counts how much you spent, right? If you spent a lot, you get all the points in that bucket. If you spent a little, you don't. And then maybe we have some other things like, do you download our papers? Do you volunteer? Are you on committees and so forth? And all of that is fleshed out in um, what we call a modeling workshop. And in the modeling workshop, you start by brainstorming and you, that's a long list, right? All the stuff that we do and every, um, every stakeholder group, you know, thinks their stuff is most important. So you have a long list, then you have to prioritize it. Um, you have to combine it like we did with the buzz hour and the webinars. You have to negotiate, right? Um, this is the fun part where um, you, know, you have to uh, agree that certain things come off the list, right? Because you can only have you can only have a hundred percent in your model, and you can't have you know a hundred different things at one percent each, right? Because that's not going to differentiate anything, right? You want to have something like you know seven or eight, maybe not more than ten. Um, you know, 10 sections uh, in total, then you implement it and you test it. And engagement is largely subjective. And so the test really is something like, 
are the the mem the individuals or the orgs that we know are most engaged, right? Um, are they at the top of the list? And um, and if they are, then you probably did a pretty good job of putting your model together. And if they are not, then maybe you are not measuring exactly the right thing. So it's kind of as simple as that, and it's pretty easy to tweak and uh, and re-implement uh, the model. So. Uh, Okay, so Lillian says, did you include members in providing feedback on your engagement points? Um, I think the answer to that is no. Am I uh, am I wrong about that, Lisa? I mean, I mean, you you included their feedback in all of the engagement activities, but in, in terms of how you modeled the engagement, right? Members weren't included in that. No, not not the not the surveying of the yeah. members. No, and and nor nor should they be right. Uh, if if we're honest about it, so that's kind of related to another question we get all the time is about you know gamification and things like that. So should the um, my thought on that is the members and the customers should be uh, you should be transparent about uh, about where they stand in relation to others in specific areas. You know, if that suits you to do that, so you know who's most engaged in the community, who's been to the most consecutive events, and things like that. But as far as how you internally want to model your engagement, right to to your idea of that exchange of value, that's something that's that's for the association uh, in particular. Okay, yeah. um, so let's wrap up then. Um, so pro tips. Uh, so Lisa, what do you think are some lessons learned or? tips or anything that you'd want to share uh, with the group to take home today? So the first thing I would say is I started off with a lot of um, data points and I would say um, really look at what data you need to make decisions with. Um, we will be going through a process to get more lean and clean um, and uh, really uh, kind of take out some of the questions that we're not using today and maybe ask some different questions. Um, but certainly call that list down um, when when you're when you're implementing um, acumen. I would say start slow, um, but also have uh, data talking points at at each of your meetings, um, whether you meet weekly, uh, bi-weekly with your teams. Um, I think it's important because it's a story that um, needs to be told and um, you can you you can learn so much from being able to to look at your data. Um, also surveying uh, your members is is key and and don't be afraid to ask the questions um, and be cheesy about, you know, how you ask it, because a lot of times people will react to those funny um, ways to get them to engage with your surveys. So those are a few uh, tips that I have um, awesome. for today. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Those, those are amazing, right? Uh, Andrew's giving you props on the lean and clean. I love it as well. Um, I'll try to, uh, to remember that going forward. The only thing I would add to that is uh, don't be afraid to to try new stuff. Right? I think that uh, Lisa and our team have done a great job with um, coming up with new products and services to meet uh, unmet needs. And it doesn't have to be big and resource intensive to do it. And um, there's also a big connection with revenue, right? So this is very uh, strategic. Uh, okay. Um, if you're interested in taking a look at Acumen, which is kind of, you know, um, a lot of the technology behind the things that we talked about today, um, you can um, feel free to visit us and schedule a demo. If you're interested in knowing more about engagement scoring, we've uh, done a couple of webinars on that, but here's one here that um, you can check out uh, on demand. Uh, of course, we would love to welcome you to the next uh, installment in, in the series where we're going to talk about um, uh, event revenue, right? So we're going to use data to um, optimize our revenue. That's coming up on the 27th of March at um uh, at uh, 3 p.m okay um thank you very much so there is uh what looks like a long question in the to chat which i promise i will um, i will get to but thank you all for your participation uh today and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time on the 27th and again lisa thank you so much for for joining us uh even though we already talked about some of this i actually learned a lot on today's uh um, today's call as well so thank you very much well, thank you for having me.
Right. 